So, all right, well, let's go ahead and get started. David, since you're unmuted, um, I'll have you lead a prayer, if you will. Sure. Thanks. All right. Almighty Father, we are so grateful to you for your love for us and all that you've done to, to prepare a, for us a way to, to be your children, to, to have a family here on earth that is all joined together in, in seeking and serving you. And we pray that you help us to be the men that we ought to be, that you help us to, to be, grow closer to, to Christ each day and to, to be a light in this world. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things I always think about, I, I've done, uh, actually gone through um, the outline of this book with uh, teenagers at the Hendersonville Church of Christ, and then I think I did it once or twice at Spring Road as well. Um, maybe didn't call it this, but every time I do a men's class, I'm always, um, and don't, you don't all have to log out once I say it, <laughs> but I always feel like I'm the last guy in the world to do a class on how to be a man. Um, and just because I've never shot a gun, I've never gone hunting, I never liked fishing. I mean, all this, all the stuff we think of as manly man kind of stuff. I mean, I just, you know, my kids have shot guy. I took Jared to a uh, shooting range when he turned 18, thought that'd be fun. He wanted to do it. Um, but, um, but I've never, I've never even shot a BB gun. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I consider myself kind of pathetic on these things, but all that being said, obviously this is looking at how God wants men to be. And of course I, I feel, um, as qualified as anyone to talk about that. Not that I put it into practice perfectly or, or even as well as some of you do, but, um, but we'll enjoy, I think going through uh this this study very much and i do enjoy it and i and i'm glad to lead the class but i always think it's kind of funny um because even on personality scales like they do studies men say approximately this number of words a day and women say this number of words a day on average i mean with anything like that i tend to be on the more feminine uh side but um anyway that's that's neither here nor there uh, but I tend to be, and, and Jennifer, interestingly enough, she on many things ends up being more on the, on the guy side of things. So it works out just fine. Um, but, uh, but I'm the one that has to ask her now, Jennifer, tell me how your day was. <laughs> Normally the women are trying to get the men to talk. And um, sometimes I have to uh, take that role. So anyway, just kind of funny, but this is, um, this is a book that I read in Mexico. Oh, back, um, it would have been in the, well, oh, I could, it was written in, well, was it written in 87 or 97? Let me look real quick. If it was 97, yeah, it was 97. So it was probably that year. I probably read it right when it came out. I took it with me on a mission trip to Mexico and I sat, um, in the when you when you take a group of teens to a foreign country you tend to uh stay up late and make sure no one starts roaming around uh we did our mission trips there at a place called the city of children uh, an orphan's home uh, about two hours south of san diego so not super far into mexico but um uh, but down there uh, far enough and um and i'll tell you what i would just i would read a chapter or two or three and and cry and just be i was so convicted by this book and part of it was lack of sleep uh, which we all tend to be a little more emotional when we haven't had much sleep and we're in a situation like that but it was it was really awesome i loved it and especially in the 90s um uh, all of us in here probably uh, can remember really being a man and uh, the whole masculine side of life had been really shot down since the 60s through the 70s and 80s you know um we want everyone to just to be some kind of morph of man and woman you know um men should not take pride in being men and you know all these things were shoving um in that direction and the the um and so this book and other things like it just stood out so strongly and we still kind of have some of that but i think people realized there were books that came out like Fatherless America um, and other things just showing how the, the, 
the shoving down of men was just hurting culture, um, especially in inner cities and in other, well, really all over across the board. But the people that were buying into men being worthless, um, I mean, just places that bought into that were ridden with crime, um, obviously ridden with abortion and all sorts of other terrible things. And so again, these books that came out in the 90s to try to help men be men again uh, were very important. And we still are struggling in our country a little bit with this, but I think we, we went over the hump and people realized, okay, we need, we need fathers, just like we need mothers. And, and things have started to push back in a better direction. We still have um, uh, conservative women like Candace Owens just this past week. She took a lot of heat for saying we need some manly men in this country. And um, she took, you know, she's been blasted on Twitter and everywhere else. Um, she gets blasted anyway, because she's a conservative, but she is still pushing uh, the fact that we need, we need people to know how to be a man. And so this, this first lesson tonight, uh, Crossroads, is about really decision making. And I think we all realize that every moment of every day we're making decisions. And in this chapter, there, there was a point where the author, Stu Weber, he had to make, he made a big choice. He made a big choice to, um, he was a Green Beret. Um, and he had decided to, um, he, had, he had done his duties in Vietnam. He had done, you know, all he was obligated to do. And he was going to leave the military. And his, uh, his superior was urging him to stay. Um, you know, why would you want to do this? And so part of the beginning of this chapter is him uh, reliving and telling his story of, you know what? No, I'm going to write books for men. No, I don't know if this book was on his mind at the time, but because uh, of course this came out 30 years later, but um, but he had decided he was going to take his life in a different direction and uh, and he was able to, and that was his crossroads. And that kind of leads into this. Um, uh, the book itself starts with, with this psalm, or this is near the beginning. I think it's in the foreword. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And its place knows it no more. And we're reminded of the brevity of life. And so it's important that we make our big crossroads decisions um, each and every day. And we've, uh, all of us in here, I'm looking down through the list real quick again, all of us in here, we've made the big decision. We've made the decision to give ourselves uh, to Jesus Christ. But there continues to be day after day, the, the need to make the decisions um, that fit into God's will. And anyway, I, I think that's a, a great reminder for us, um, just the same as reminding ourselves that our lives are like a vapor, uh, here today, gone tomorrow, and uh, very, very important for us. I, I will say, I, 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 I may have said it, but just always realize, I think you all do, you've been in enough classes of mine, anytime, you know, unmute or raise your little hand thing on the Zoom, and um, I'll catch that or put something in the chat, um, any way you want to communicate, but you're always welcome to jump in, uh, no problem with that at all. So here's the basic outline of the book, and I'll show you the actual outline for our quarter in a second. Um, uh, he puts forward that in the Garden of Eden, Adam had, there were four pillars, there were four things that he was, was to uh, uh, have, and we'll, we'll go through those in more detail in a, in a week or two. We'll touch on that today, how the pillars fell when he sinned, um, but there's, a, a man's life should include the king pillar, uh, a man of vision and character. And I think we would, we're, we're all going to agree with all these, of course. We want to be people of vision. We want to be people of character. Uh, the second pillar is the warrior pillar, a man of strength and a man of power. Uh, the third is to be a mentor, um, a leader, um, a man of faith, and a man of wisdom. And then finally, a man of heart and a man of love. And that is the the friend pillar. So that's what we'll be going through over these. Actually, this won't be 13 weeks. This will be 11 weeks. So I'm sorry to rip you off, but you're going to get a, a, a little teeny break at the end of uh, February, beginning of March. Um, I'll be over in Ghana um, in all likelihood if everything goes according to plans. Um, uh, Victoria is heading over there, I think in a week. She may, it may just be a day or two. Anyway, she, she's, she goes over there for three or four months every year. 
she's heading out soon and she'll be there th through March, I think. Um, and the, the congregation over there and her, they've invited me to come for a week and help with evangelism and preaching and, and other things. And, and also putting a roof on a building. I'm not going to personally put the roof on the building, but I'm going to help buy the supplies and stuff like that. So anyway, so you're going to get a little break. If you guys don't want a break, we'll work that out then, but someone could uh, teach for two more weeks, of course. Okay. So um, then uh, Stu Weber writes, and it takes four pillars to make a man, a man who will bear the weight, stand against the elements and hold one small civilization intact and his small civilization is either your family or your church family. Basically, your little civilization is the people around you. And, and we are called to be the leaders. We're called to be the people that, that hold things together to whatever extent we've been given uh, the responsibility, whatever scope our lives have. Um, in a world that would like nothing better than to tear it down. And that's an allusion to Satan himself. Um, it's a realization that our culture doesn't really like people to be spiritual. Our culture doesn't tend to care for faith-based things. And um, again, I wouldn't have said that uh, back when I was in high school, but we keep drifting to a place where it becomes harder and harder and with more resistance um, against uh, spiritual things. And then uh, the contemplation at the bottom there, what kind of man am I? What kind of man are you? How can we become what we so deeply need to be? Let's walk the path together and see what we might find. And so that's how uh, Weber kind of uh, moves us and draws us in uh, to be interested in, uh, in what he has to say. Okay, so here's our winter quarter. Uh, tonight, obviously, is December 10th. Um, we'll have two classes right now at a normal time this week and next week. Um, December 24th and December 31st are obviously Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, so we won't do that. We'll have two Wednesday morning classes. If you're able to be here, that's that's awesome. If not, I'll um, you know I'll 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 still do the class live. So whoever can be here at 10 a.m. on those Wednesdays, you know, fabulous. And then if you're not able to be, if you're working or etc., then you can of course watch them later um, if you choose to. Um, he has. Uh, four chapters on the king pillar uh we'll just spend two not we'll spend two weeks on each pillar so next week you can see is play the man then the four pillars in eden he kind of outlines all that we'll do that uh two days before christmas wednesday morning and then we'll spend two weeks on each of the pillars uh so we'll do uh you can see those chapters but talk about the king pillar um and then the warrior pillar and then the mentor pillar and then the friend pillar so um, and the friend pillar also, I'll be leaving for Ghana on February 18th. So we're going to do that one Wednesday morning, uh, the day before I take off. And then, uh, and then, th then that'll be the class. So um, anyway, I'm excited about it. Hopefully you guys are too. It'll be fun. I, I will throw in, he uses quite a bit of scripture, but I'll throw in more. We'll be definitely very scripturally uh, based. And so you can see highlighted tonight's lesson. I didn't really need to put it in there twice um, for this week since it's the very first one. But any, any, let me go back to that. Any uh, comments on those first couple passages or or the concept in general uh, before we before we move on? Yeah, George, go ahead. It's just interesting where society has come because mm -hmm. I believe it wasn't Ken. I don't think this happened in the states. I mean, they believed boys and girls were the same at one time, and they tried to make a baby male. Uh, a female surgically and chemically uh, yeah and it didn't work it's like why is this guy playing with trucks what's wrong with him <laughs> and you know they don't believe that anymore but society's come through some turmoils through that yeah yeah and i'll, I'll t uh, david moore last night in his um uh, prayer or maybe right before he prayed um you know brought up uh, some of that same kind of uh, stuff. And in California right now, um, if your child um, is showing, like if, you're, if your girl, if, you're, if your five-year-old girl is a tomboy, and so you kind of, a, you know, the parents are kind of wondering, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't go with the five-year-old. But well, the bottom line is in California, if you have your child or even teenager, if you have them go to counseling, and the counseling 
is designed to help them feel fulfilled in their own sex and their own gender. If it's if it is designed to keep them from making a change, you can go to jail. It is it is actually punishable for the parents uh, with jail time if they put their child into counseling that would help that child understand themselves as God created them. And um, so, you know, some of our, you know, California, I don't know if there are any other states with laws like that, um, but it is actually illegal to get your kid counseling if they're going through any kind of struggle on that, unless it's counseling in how to make the change, then it's fine. So it's, it, we're, you know, hopefully that'll kind of die out there and it won't spread across the country like other moral things have. But, uh, you know, um, we, we're still, you know, we're still probably dealing with some of the troubles. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Uh, I'm good, actually. Thank oh, you, though. you, yeah, you got unmuted. So I, I thought you yeah, wanted to say something. Oh, it's fine. Yeah, no problem at all. All right. So, all right. So Psalm uh, 2512. So this is this is more into the crossroads uh, section, uh, the actual chapter for tonight. If there is a man who fears the Lord, he shall be shown the path he should choose. And, you know, I really um, uh, believe that to be true. Obviously, it's scripture. And I think if we're seeking, if we are someone who who fears the Lord, who puts the Lord first, uh, these things will become more and more clear in our lives. I'm going to end tonight with Psalm 1, which we used last night in the in the spiritual disciplines class. And I thought, yeah, that's just that's perfect for tonight, too, because it it delineates the paths, uh, the, the path that is the Lord's and the path that is not the Lord's and, and the difference between the two. So I think that's really important. And in Psalm 25, we read this. Uh, if we fear the Lord, that the path will be laid out for us uh, just about, which is which is neat. Um, so uh, we always have a choice. And um, and this is a quote from the book. Uh, this is the story I was telling you about at the beginning uh, when Weber uh, was a Green Beret and he was going to, um, uh, to to head out of military service. Sir, I cannot stay. I have orders from higher up. And though it may seem a bit corny, even imaginary to you, it is a very real headquarters. It is in reality, the throne room of the universe. I believe the King himself has intentions for me. I believe he has actually guided me. I have a clear direction in my soul. I have developed a sense of conviction from God. I must go this way. It's a matter of principle, faith, trust, and obedience. Sir, I must take this road. And, you know, what a great statement. And I think that's, you know, we all, we didn't say those words, of course, but we all made that decision when we came to Christ. We decided I must take this road. And the important thing for us is to stay on that road and to continue to make that confession, that to state that conviction every day of our lives. You know, this is the way I'm going to live. This is the way I'm going to be. I'm going to, in this context, I'm going to be the man that God has called me to be. And I'm going to influence the people around me to the very best of my ability. I'm going to stay on the, the narrow path as opposed to the broad path uh, that leads to uh, destruction. Um, he then talks about uh, the, we don't know uh, who wrote Psalm 119, but talks about the person and their dedication, uh, the person that wrote this psalm. Though rulers plot and slander me, your servant meditates on your statutes. Yes, I find delight in your rules. They give me guidance. Guide me in the path of your commands, for I delight to walk in it. Give me a desire for your rules rather than for wealth gained unjustly. Turn my eyes away from what is worthless. Revive me with your word. Your loyal followers will be glad when they see me, for I find hope in your word. All your commands are reliable. I am pursued without reason. Help me. They have almost destroyed me here on the earth, but I do not. But I do not reject your precepts. Distress and hardship confront me, yet I find delights delight in your commands. I am up before dawn, crying for help. I find hope in your word. And then he goes back to 54 to 56, 
Your statutes have been my songs in the house where I live. I remember your name during the night, O Lord, and I will keep your law. This has been my practice, for I observe your precepts. And again, all with the thought of, we're going to make a decision. We're going to decide day by day, hour by hour, uh, that we want to do what God wants us to do, that we want to follow that path. Uh, two paths, <laughs> and we know uh, the one we need to pick. So it may be something really simple. It may be whether or not to be kind uh, to a stranger we meet. It may be um, something a little more serious, whether or not to um, be involved in some kind of indiscretion, whether it's uh, a, a, a business dealing that's bad or a sexual thing that is inappropriate or whatever. But we, we must make the decision consistently throughout life and stay on the, the path that God wants us to. Um, I think we all know Robert Frost's poem, um, The Road Less Traveled. Uh, Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both, and be one traveler long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay and leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference." Of course, in a spiritual context, taking the narrow path really does make all the difference. Every choice we make in life makes a difference, but the ultimate choice, the choice to follow Christ and have him as our leader, it is the one that truly makes uh, all the difference. Let me find, there are a few things in the chapter I want to read to you. I don't want to miss one of them. I think it's right here. Oh, it's in a second. Um, William Bennett, I don't know if you all remember him. He was the Secretary of Education way back when. He wrote the Book of Virtues. He's, he wrote several books after uh, he was done filling that role. And he summed up uh, Frost's poem by saying, courage does not follow rutted pathways. In other words, take that road less traveled. Um, and it takes courage to do it. And then the author of this book, Weber, wrote, uh, maybe that's why the road toward God's intentions is a narrow way, and there are few who find it. And then again, he try, he, he not just tries, he draws us into the book a little more. How about you? How will you decide? And I, I think that's exciting, and I think that's good. We, we always want to um, take that narrow way. We want to take uh, God's way. Okay, so when the first pillars fell, and I do want to read this a little bit to you uh, from this part of the, the, the book. This is talking about Adam um, in the garden. As he stood there that day, that seemingly ordinary day in the garden, he held a piece of fruit in his hand. His wife had indicated it was a good thing. She should know she'd already tasted it. And the evil one who would one day wear the title of prince and power of the air had done everything he could to make it appealing. No piece of fruit had ever appeared so luscious and desirable. On the one hand, taking a bite made such sense to Adam. The voices in his ear were strong. On the other hand, he'd been told explicitly that he shouldn't touch it by no less an authority than God himself. Adam stood at a crossroads. For the first time in his life, he was experiencing the tug of competing voices. Was he going to do what others around him wanted him to do? Take the common route, the broad way? Or was he going to listen to the instructions of the creator? Would he show some courage and do the right thing, choosing to take God at his word? Would he listen to the perfect father and friend? Or would he take the road that others would choose for him, a road that would prove to be incredibly well-traveled over the millennia? Would Adam calibrate the compass of his masculinity according to God's intentions or to his own appetites? Well, you know the choice he made. He decided to go his own way. And that single choice on that one day in history affected every move he would make and every thought he would think for the remaining 900 or so years of his life. It impacted every single member of his human family, his wife, his sons, his daughters, their mates, 
their children, their children's children for thousands of generations. Eden had been such a good place, heaven on earth, so to speak, just a small civilization nestled in one corner of a wide new world. Yet when it collapsed, the shockwaves through space and time have sent billions reeling. When the original pillars of manhood fell in Eden, it started a falling dominoes chain reaction that has crushed life and hope in untold numbers of small civilizations through Earth's history. Adam's simple, single, silly choice blew it till kingdom come. It was a single crossroads on a single day that stretched across thousands of years. Evidently, Adam didn't see it coming, but he should have. God could not have made it more clear. They had talked very specifically about it. The God of the universe had walked with him and talked with him in the garden. He should have known better. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then the, um, then and again, jump in if you want to, of, of course, anytime. Then um, he kind of shifts to when the U.S. pillars fell. And he talks about the class of 1965, which um, I think he would be a little older than that because I think he was in Vietnam and already was a Green Beret by about this time. So um, anyway, but he was near that. Um, uh, graduated from high school almost for sure in the 60s at some point, probably the early 60s. And he talks about how we just started going downhill. And this book was written in 1997. So for him, it would have been over the last 30 years or quarter century approximately. Talks about how SAT scores fell you know, so very much that they changed the whole test and put it on a different scale so that they wouldn't have to say people were getting worse, but they could just say, you know, hey, we're doing okay again, rah, rah. Um, talked about, talks about crime rates and pregnancy rates and abortion and all the different things. And we've, we've seen stats like that. We know how the country has gone uh, since, the, since the mid 60s. Um, but we really lost something there. And again, the, the book Fatherless America, which is somewhere back here on these shelves, you know, a lot of different research and a lot of different studies came out about what we had done to ourselves. And again, hopefully we're, we're at least in a teeny bit of a way uh, realizing since about 2000 to now that, that it does matter um, if you have uh, men or not. Um, so anyway, he goes through those different things and how our pillars are down. And then um, uh, relates the story of Joshua here. I think this is really cool. I always, I quote Joshua a lot when he's talking about, you know, as for me and my house, you know, uh, we're going to trust the Lord. Uh, but this is, this is earlier. Um, this is way earlier than that. Jo Joshua 5. When Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him holding a drawn sword. Uh, many feel that this is a uh, theophany, that this is Christ. Um, Joshua approached him and asked him, are you on our side or allied with our enemies? He answered, truly, I am the commander of the Lord's army. Now I have arrived. Joshua bowed down with his face to the ground and asked, what does my master want to say to his servant? The commander of the Lord's army answered Joshua, remove your sandals from your feet because the place where you stand is holy. Joshua did so. And the, the point here is the Lord wants to be in charge. Uh, when David fought Goliath, he let God be in charge. He told Goliath, it's not going to be me. It's because I'm fighting for the Lord. And same with Joshua. Joshua had great faith throughout his days. And he was willing to bow down to this man with a drawn sword. He was willing to hand over authority. And that's what a a real child of God in our, you know, men and women, but in our context, that's what a real man does. A real man surrenders to God Almighty and allows God to be the ruler, allows God to, to be in charge, to take control of the army, to take control of our little, you know, sphere of influence that we have uh, in this life. And so really a cool um, illustration there. Um, all right, then kind of wrapping up this uh, particular section here. Um, men in America today are at a crossroads. You're probably at one yourself. And for for those of us in this room right now, now if you're watching this later on the, on the tape, um, maybe you haven't decided to come to Christ yet. 
Um, and of course, that would be, that's the huge crossroads, making that initial decision. But again, every day, every hour, at all times, we're making decisions and they either glorify God or they don't. They either move us toward greater faith or they don't. Um, and so the statement is still true. You're probably at one yourself. We've experienced the tug of God in our hearts. We've begun to sense his direction for us. We're beginning to move back down the trail he intended for us as his men in the first place. We're changing our priorities. We're determined to follow the king. We're going to be godly men. We're going to keep our promises. And then he says, no, it won't be easy. It's a road less traveled in our culture, but then courage does not follow rutted pathways. So he goes back to Bennett's uh, quote. Um, so let's read Psalm 1, and I'll just have a few comments about it and then uh, open it up for anything else uh, you all might want to, uh, to add in. Uh, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The implication in verse 5, of course, is that the righteous will stand in the judgment. We will we'll be okay, um, and we will be part of that congregation of the righteous. Uh, and the Lord knows these things. He knows the way of the righteous, uh, but the way of the wicked will perish. So we, there are some big initial crossroads in life, and of course, when we come to Christ, but every single day is a crossroads. Um, every single day, we are called to, to be the men that God wants us to be, to be strong. And again, we'll talk about the king pillar, the warrior pillar, the mentor pillar, and the friend pillar um, as we move through, uh, move through the quarter. So any thoughts or um, anything any of you want to add this evening? Yeah, go ahead, George. I think in decision making, the hardest thing for me to learn was that, yeah, I count on God to be there on those decisions when you check with the righteous people and it's like 98 yes and 2% no. But a lot of decisions are 49-51. And I've learned that I've just got to believe God's in the 49-51 decisions, too. That's, that's what I choose to believe. <laughs> yeah, I think that's great. Greg, um, and it's, it's not Greg's quote, but Greg likes to quote um, um, the person who said it. It's someone we would all recognize. I don't know if it's Calvin or um, it's, it's some person in church history, some theologian. And, um, and this, this person says, um, you know, if we, if we do everything, you know, talking about the 99% or way, you know, if, if, if we make all those good decisions and preach about all the things that everyone's in agreement with us, uh, but his, the, the person's point is, but if we fail to preach the truth at the one point that let's say our culture is dealing with, or our congregation is dealing with, if, if we fail on that one thing to speak the truth, because we're scared, or whatever the reason, then we have failed to make the right decision. Um, you know, we we need to, and it's not exactly what you were saying, George, but but we need to, whatever, no matter what, whether it's a 98 to 2 or a 49 to 51 breakdown, we need to be, or if, if God is in the 2% of the people we're talking to and the 98 are again, you know, then we still need to be on God's side, um, obviously. Um, and so I've always liked that quote, obviously, Greg remembers everything he reads or hears, and so he can quote it perfectly, um, and I just kind of bumbled through it, but but I really like the concept that we need, whatever, whatever the issue is right now, we need to be on top of it uh, for God uh, as his proclaimers and his defenders. So any other uh, thoughts? All right, next week is play the man. And then the week after that, uh, the four pillars in the Garden of Eden on uh, the 23rd. And then we'll, we'll have uh, two weeks each for the four pillars. So um, it is, it's really neat. I, I like the study and hopefully you will too. Yeah, go ahead, David. Oh, I was just, 
I didn't have anything. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. Let's um Roger, if you'd say a closing prayer for us, that would be fabulous. And then we can all uh, just uh, chat and visit for a little bit if we'd like. Sure. Thanks. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for all the blessings that we have in this life, and especially the blessings that we have in Christ and the difference that makes in our lives, our families' lives. And we thank you for opportunities we have like this to study together, even during this pandemic. We pray that uh, these studies will help us to be uh, better Christian men and live our lives closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.